put uh, now we go on to dr chitra who is going to be talking about addressing residual refractive error post operatively uh, she did speak about uh, uh, accuracy of biometry we always try for the best but even in the best of fans best of institutions there are refractive surprises and today with the patients expecting near hematopic outcome in all situations let's see how she handles it uh very good morning to one and all of you and uh, my special thanks to dr ramurthy for including me in his course and my due is to talk on residual refractive error post operatively a residual refractive error post operatively is actually the primary reason for dissatisfaction after a premium lens surgery where you have counseled your patient for long and told him that you're going to give him visual independence and the sources of these residual refractive errors in this particular study which was done in wales from 2003 to 2010 long back in that in that huge number of eyes only 164 of these eyes had uh, issues and these were the four main reasons which was outlined and which is which is relevant to us is the inaccurate biometry wrong iul par selection transcription errors and handwriting misinterpretation and then you realize that so much of it is in your hands and need to be preoperatively conscious is to be is, is cannot be undermined at all so planning for the worst is how you are doing the best before the surgery now having said that we do have a range of intraocular lens formula the third generation now the fourth generation the fifth generation which uh, so it seemed necessary for you to know how accurate you are with these so the all of these for many of these formulas were put together and these and we looked at the target emetropic outcome within minus 0.25 plus minus 25 or plus minus 0.5 and it was checked with those on uh, 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 Bio, optical biometry like uh, it could be a, a spectral domain or a swept source oct or an olcr and what came out of it was the best as of now are the hill rbf the barrett universal 2 and the evo which is emetropia verifying opticals but even then they were only 92% within plus minus 0.5 diopter of target emetropia so the formulas themselves have a limitation there but if you add it with your inaccuracies then that is going to get compounded so what you need to know is you would hear everywhere about different formulas by different surgeon you should go back and use the formula which is best suited to you for that you need to analyze your results you might find that you could want to use an hill rbf and an barrett universal 2 and keep them as two formulas to go on but believe me the hill rbf is based on a statistical model and uh, barrett universal 2 is on a thick lens formula in spite of being different uh, uh, technologies they do work work very well and these are the absolute gold uh, good platforms to keep to compare because it's often necessary to validate your results with two different uh, iul par calculations and also check for consistency you need to also remember when you're doing premium iuls your threshold for using a toric iul has to be extremely low We, this was a FACO study which was done. What this found was that out of 100% person person oper getting operated, 70% of them were fine with even the third generation formula. It is that 30% of them, when you check their do their keratometry and you find that the standard deviation is more than 0.2, then you need to get cautious. Is it dry eye status? You check for dry eye. If there is dry eye, treat the dry eye and then repeat the biometry. In some, you get to know it's a refractive surgery eye or a keratoconus or PMD. Then just a routine topography is not enough. You have to do a tomography. You may have to look at the EKR value. You may have to use those specific formulas. You may have to use the right toric calculator. And most importantly, you have to use the fourth generation formula and beyond. of course it goes without saying it has to be a perfect surgery right from getting that right rexus overlap over the optic of the iul and ensuring that you definitely check your post op outcomes to understand where you are are you poised for a premium cataract surgery without any of these residual effects then comes determining what went wrong now this was a patient who came one week post op surgery and if you look at it he had a plus date diopter of refractive surprise now before we just go out go in and straight remove the lens you need to look at the pre op scan and the post op scan to understand you need to look at the labeling on the iul you need to look at your emr entry whether there was any which where where was the error and you found that there was actually no error at all before you assume it is the iul part which is wrong 
You have to do a refraction, repeat the refraction with an another optometrist. You should do a fundus evaluation, whether there's a CME lurking, what, is it the right time to explant this lens? You need to look at the surgical records, and then if everything tells you it's a wrong IOA, then you would remove it. But now there are certain considerations. You need to be sure it's a stable refraction. It's a post-RKI. You may have to wait for the refractive stability to occur before you jump. Of course, plus 8 is too much. You would remove it. But for small errors of plus 1.52 and all that, and this is a post-RKI, you have to wait for the stability of refraction. You have to look at the age of the patient. Is he fit for surgery? Not this plus 8, but another smaller residual error. Does he need a surgery? Are his visual needs met? With sometimes having a, uh, with the rule as Stigmatism will allow him a depth of uh, focus and better reading ability. Sometimes if both eyes are operated in a binocular status, he might do well. Then do I remove the lens? It's something you have to keep thinking in your mind because there are challenges when you're going to remove the lens unless you are a veteran surgeon. So you have to, at that time, there's more dry eye, there's going to be more inflammation. Take care of that. Look at the zonular status. You have to be extra cautious. It's an already operated eye. Is there already a YAG opening there or a PCR is there? So, you know, all of this you have to look at before you decide to remove the lens. And when you're going to do your refractive enhancement, it is, could also be like if there is a little residual error in a multifocal, sometimes if you operate on the other eye and give time for neural adaptation, the patients do well. Again, if it's a toric IOL, it is better that you go and realign the toric IOL within two weeks or at least, because then there'll be capsular fibrosis and then moving the lens would m impose more stress on the zonal apparatus. Of course, if it is a wrong IOL, you need to remove it earliest. Sometimes there'll be just a small amount of refractive error which is there. Just doing an arcuate keratotomy is all that is needed. Sometimes you will find that the patient is just not happy, wants some more. Then you could use your micro keratome if you have, don't charge them for it, then do an enhancement or use your, uh, do a PRK and then in a, uh, treat them. But then you should look at the corneal thickness in these patients. The older patients would have dry eye status that has to be treated. They can wait, but you have to wait for the refractive stability, the topography to be all right before you decide to do enhancement. Now look at this particular file. If you look at the sphere in the cylinder, the spherical equivalent is nearly zero. Just looking at this uh, thing itself, you know that this patient will benefit by toric IO rotation. But you have now the astigmaticfix.com or the Barrett uh, T uh, TK Barrett treatment formula, wherein it will tell you when to rotate the lens. If you enter your data and that, it can go on the website and do it too. It will tell you when to rotate it, when you have to do a, a, a bioptics or a laser touch up. It will tell you when to place a piggyback lens. It will tell you when you have to do an IOL exchange. And in this particular patient, we had to just do a repositioning of the toric IOL. You don't have to inject viscoelastic in these patients. Just open up the side ports. You may have to make a fresh entry in that area. And just with the irrigation on, you could realign it. And if you're lucky to have an over a varion imaging or something, it becomes easier. But otherwise, preoperatively, you could mark on the slit lamp and whichever way you do it and then go back and realign it. And these patients do so well. And that kind of visual independence you give, he is going to bring you 10 more patients. Again, but this was a particular case wherein, sorry, this is the particular case which I'm coming back to, wherein the uh, IOL had to be removed. So you need to get the haptic and the optic out of the bag, pull out the haptic, one of the haptics, and hold it, and that gives stability. And you need not have to cut all the way up. You need to have injected viscoelastic, keep the PC away. Even that much of a cut is enough, and with the hand-over-hand -hand technique, you could remove it and replace it with the other lens. This patient came back after four months post-op and had a significant hyperopic error. So you can do a piggyback lens in these eyes and how essentially it could be a lens material, preferably a hydrophilic, which is not the same material as the primary lens. It should have a larger optic. We have Sulcoflex lens and the other similar companies. And the haptics allows it to rest in the sulcus properly. And it has a posterior concave surface. So there is a space between the primary IOL in the bag and this. So there won't be interlenticular opacification. And the haptics of the second IOL should be placed at right angles to where it was in the primary case. Then, of course, post-operatively, you can see that the vault is fine. 
The second eye often gives you a chance. As you can see, that the patient had a symphony implanted in multifocal, and the patient had a plus one residual error, and he was just not happy. But he was an avid reader, and that, that Technis uh, multifocal were available, which has a plus four ad, and after implanting it in the second eye, he did very well. This was another patient who had a symphony done in the other eye. He had a small amount of my, uh, plus bar and was not too, that happy. So you can do a micro mono vision correction, give him a more myopia in the other eye. But let's understand, you should, the difference of myopia between the two eyes should not be more than 0.75 because then there will be loss of stereopsis and quality of vision therein. So you, within that range you could do a micro mono vision and you could take care of these patients. But there are some patients who have a little near vision difficulty but they look happy just because you have theoretically fixed about 6, 6, N6 vision. If he's a happy patient, just let him be, just pat him on the back. But you just know that how you need to get careful in your future cases. Probably the actual treatment of residual refractive error would come when there's a breakthrough technology where we have post-operatively like the light adjustable lenses, we could adjust the power of the lenses if something like that comes or we are better able to estimate the effective lens position which is what is a challenge with all the IOL formulas. If we have done it all, then probably some years down the line we will all be talking of doing only 6, 6 and 6 for all our cataract patients. Thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive coverage, uh, Chitra. I mean, in case you have to do a IOL exchange, uh, how much time would you uh, allow before you take it up? If you are, you are so sure, as I told you earlier, that an IOL exchange is uh, needed, that is obvious, then let's not waste time on that at all. But you have to be sure. So because before fibrosis and the uh, uh, haptics get attached, that you have to cut the haptics, just remove the optics, let's not go that far. You make it the easiest time for you yourself to remove the uh, IOL of the, out of the eye. There are different ways. You can pull out the haptics, cut it halfway, or you can cut it full way. There are some hydrophilic lenses where I've seen surgeons doing it without cutting it at all, uh, hand over hand technique. So there are might some people just cut a cut uh, one triangle. The point I actually wanted to make was, you know, most often we are implanting hydrophobic acrylic intraocular lenses. So obviously if you get a plus six diopter surprise on the first post-operative day, you'll go ahead and explain the lens on the first day itself. But otherwise if it's a smaller error, it's a good idea to uh, wait up to a period of one month and if you feel that uh, this lens has to be exchanged, it's a good idea to do it before a month's time. It's possible to expand these lenses, take it out of the capsular bag, even at six months, one year, we have done that. But before the capsule really fibrosis down and holds this lens, it may be a good idea to take this lens out. Thank you. Thank you. So